In Module 10, we'll be reviewing wearing guidelines for flame-resistant clothing. Our learning objectives are to understand how to properly wear FR clothing to maximize protection and to understand some of the wearing guidelines as they relate to undergarments, outer garments, and rainwear. First off, wearing guidelines. Pr protective garments really must be selected for the worst case scenario. So you want to make sure that end users understand what they're asking for protection, what, what levels of protection they're asking for, what they expect the flame resistant garment to do. Always have to consider the worst case scenario to make sure the most appropriate PPE is being considered. Next, obviously, the garment should be worn properly. If you have shirt sleeves, they should be rolled down. Collars should be buttoned up. Outerwear should be secured if it's supposed to be. Zippered, buttoned, snapped. People should not be wearing their shirts with the sleeves rolled up. They shouldn't be wearing their, their uh, shirts untucked from the pants. These are all very important items that sometimes get overlooked by the end user. Obviously, another consideration is what about head, neck, face, ear protection, hand and foot protection. Those have to be considered also. Most of our discussions in this module and the previous modules have been about uh, coveralls, shirts and pants, apparel. Cannot forget your feet, your hands, your face, your neck. Those obviously need the same type of protection because they're going to be exposed to the same type of hazard. Garments that are selected should have a good functional fit. There's nothing worse than having a protective garment that doesn't fit someone. If it doesn't fit them so they can't do their job, uh, it's too big so it can't, they can't do their job, that's not good. But additionally, for thermal protective apparel, you want loose fitting clothing. You want the clothing to be as loose fitting as practical, uh, not so loose that obviously they can't do their job, but you want it loose so that there's an air gap between the person's skin and the protective garment because air is a wonderful insulator and having a good flame resistant garment on the outside and a nice layer of air before you get to the skin is going to provide increased protection. Another obvious point, if you're wearing a flame resistant garment, you need to make sure you keep it clean. It should not have flammable contaminants on it. In many industries, people are working around uh, different types of materials that might get on their ga garment. They might contaminate it. You need to make sure the garments are properly laundered. Home laundry is possible with Nomex 3A and Nomex Comfort. Um, dry cleaning is possible. Industrial laundry is possible. All of those options will work on the fabric on the, used in the garments, but it must be done on a routine basis. Because if you leave flammable contaminants on a coverall or a shirt and pant, they're supposed to be flame resistant, and that contaminant is flammable if an accident were to happen and a fire exposure were to occur, even though the flame resistant garment would not burn, the flammable contaminants on it would burn until they were totally consumed, which would increase someone's burn injury. And then there's a the whole area of undergarments. Undergarments are anything that are worn underneath the primary flame resistant garment. The main guidance here is undergarments can be good as long as they're non-meltable. So you don't want polyester, you don't want nylon, you don't want polypropylene as an undergarment. Because even though the flame resistant garment will not burn, if you have a meltable uh, undergarment, enough heat might pass through to cause that undergarment to melt and stick to someone's skin, which will increase burn injury potential. The acceptable non-melting undergarments would be certainly any flame resistant material like Nomex 3A, like Nomex Comfort, or things like cotton, wool, silk, rayon, viscose, those are all non-melting also. And so they can be worn underneath the flame resistant garment to provide additional thermal insulation and protection. Now let's talk about outerwear. Many times people consider that they're wearing a flame resistant garment and they don't consider what they're wearing on top of it. For example, they might be wearing a coverall that's flame resistant. And, but they go outside in the rain and they put a nylon windbreaker or a raincoat on top that isn't flame resistant. Well, when the flame or arc occurs, it doesn't know that it doesn't know and it doesn't care that there's a flame resistant garment underneath. The outermost garment is going to see that heat and flame. It likely will ignite, melt, and continue to burn. So you have to make sure that outerwear has to be flame resistant. Flammable outerwear should not be worn over flame resistant garments because it can ignite and burn. Additionally. Um, if you think about it, having a rain uh, suit on top of a um, flame resistant coverall, for example, if that rain suit catches fire, it's actually going to increase the burn injury because it's going to be right next to the wearer. So we want to make sure you consider outerwear as well as, as underwear. This next slide shows side-by-side -side comparison of some arc testing that was done. On the left is rainwear with a non-meltable FR substrate. 
On the right is rainware with a meltable substrate. And these were both exposed to an arc blast of the exact same duration. What you can see is the meltable substrate on the right hand side actually broke open, caught fire, and continued to burn. There's a t-shirt that was worn underneath that rain suit, and you can see the t-shirt on the right mannequin actually is burned and charred in the center, whereas on the left mannequin, which is wearing a non-meltable FR substrate, so it's an FR rainwear suit, even though there's charring and discoloration of the rain suit, it stayed together, it did not ignite, it did not melt, and that's exactly what you wanted to do. So obviously the outermost garment must be flame and arc resistant. On the next slide, I have two videos I'd like to show you, which show the importance of the outermost layer being flame resistant in a fire hazard. The first video I'm going to show you is on the lower left-hand side. And again, this is rainwear. On the left is non-FR rainwear in yellow. On the right is FR rainwear in orange. Uh, there is a fire exposure of the same duration for both. And you'll see what happens when we show the video of non-FR versus FR rainwear. The one item I do want to note in this video, we were also testing some gloves on the, uh, the mannequin on the right hand side and those gloves had some blue dots on them. Those dots we found out were, were flammable. So you'll see the right hand of the mannequin on the right hand side having some long after flame. If you could ignore that, you really want to look at the garment itself and you'll see that the FR rainwear garment self extinguished where the non-FR rainwear garment ignited and continued to burn after the torch is turned off. So let's go ahead and look at that video. In this video, which is a four second exposure in the Thermomen test chamber, you'll see how a non-FR rainwear suit compares to an FR rainwear suit. The four second fireball is initiated, the torches turn off, the garment on the left, which is not flame resistant, immediately ignites, starts to burn. You can also see that it's melting and dripping, molten polymer down from the mannequin. Obviously, you do not want to wear something like that over your flame resistant garment. You've essentially defeated the purpose of wearing a flame resistant garment where you wear flammable outerwear. On the other side, on the right side, you see a flame resistant rain suit. After the torch is one out, after four seconds, completely self extinguished and would actually provide a good level of protection if worn over other FR clothing. As I mentioned, the, the glove on the right hand side was another test we're running at the same time. It just shows the gloves also should be considered, obviously, to make sure they're appropriately FR. Now, the next video I want to show you is also about outerwear. And what we've done in this particular situation is we have a cotton, regular everyday cotton coverall and a Nomex 3A coverall. The Nomex 3A coverall is 6 ounces per square yard or 200 gram per square meter. And it's an everyday cotton work coverall. And all we've done in these videos is one time we tested the cotton coverall underneath the Nomex 3A coverall. The other test burn we put the cotton coverall on top of the Nomex 3A coverall. So here you've got the flame resistant fabric on the outside on one, and you've got the flammable fabric on the outside of the other. So let's go ahead and look at that video and see how it performs. In this video, on the left is the 6 ounce Nomex 3A coverall over an 8 ounce 100% cotton coverall. On the right is the same 100% cotton coverall, 8 ounces per square yard, over a 6 ounce per square yard Nomex 3A coverall. A 4 second exposure, there are no undergarments underneath the coveralls. So it's going to be a four second exposure that's going to start. You can see the pilot lights are lit and then very quickly engulfs both mannequins. On the left hand side it's a Nomex worn over, over top of the cotton. Immediately the Nomex self extinguishes. On the right hand side the flammable cotton fabric ignites. It's going to continue to burn vigorously adding more burn injury to the person wearing the coverall. Recognize they're wearing a Nomex coverall underneath, but that Nomex coverall's ability to protect is being overwhelmed by extended burning of the coverall. 14% predicted burn injury versus 80% predicted burn injury. Exact same four second exposure. It's very, very important for end users to remember that if they need flame resistant clothing, the outermost layer always must be flame resistant, the innermost layer must be non-melting.